Does marijuana disrupt sleep? Yeah, it, it does. There are problems with THC and there are twofold. The first is that it too, but through different mechanisms, seems to block REM sleep. And that's why a lot of people, when they're using, will tell me, look, you know, I I definitely, I was dreaming, I don't remember, you know, many of my dreams. And then when they stop using uh, THC, they'll say, I was having, you know, just crazy, crazy dreams. And the reason is because there is a rebound mechanism. REM sleep is very clever and alcohol is the same way in this sense. It's the same homeostatic mechanism. Some people will tell me, look, if I have a bit of a wild Friday night with some alcohol, you know, maybe I'll sleep late into the next morning and I'll just have these really intense dreams. So, and I thought I wasn't having any REM sleep. Well, the way it works is that it's during in the middle of the night, really, um, when alcohol blocks your REM sleep and your brain is smart. It understands how much REM sleep you should have had, how much REM sleep you have not because the alcohol has been in the system. And finally, in those early morning hours when you're getting through to sort of, you know, six, REM seven, like eight a.m., all of a sudden, your brain not only goes back to having the same amount of REM it would have had, it does that, plus it tries to get back all of the REM sleep that it's lost. Mm -hmm. Does it get back all of the REM sleep? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It never gets back all of the REM sleep, but it tries. And so you have these really intense periods of REM sleep, hence you have really intense, bizarre dreams. And that's what happens also with THC. You build up this pressure for REM sleep, this debt for REM sleep. Will you ever pay it back? It doesn't seem as though you get back everything that you lost, but will you get back some of it? Yes, the brain will start to devour more because it's been starved of REM sleep for so long. But one of the bigger problems with THC that we worry about is withdrawal dependency. So as you start to use THC for sleep, there can be a, a dependency tolerance. So you start to need more to get the same sleep benefit. And when you stop using, you usually get a very severe rebound insomnia. And in fact, it's so potent that it's typically part of the clinical um, withdrawal profile from THC, from cannabis. People who are regular uh, pot smokers, if you, that many of will insist they're not addicted and, and in, maybe indeed they don't actually follow the profile of classical addiction. I don't know. I'm guessing some do, some don't. But um, if you ask them, well, what if I took away all marijuana consumption for, I don't know, two weeks? That thought scares many of them. And many of them will experience intense anxiety without marijuana, which speaks to perhaps not addiction, but a certain kind of dependency. Cannabis is a unique instance in which nowadays we are hearing, yes, it's becoming legal in a number of areas. And we talked earlier about why that's probably a good thing in most circumstances, but that we aren't just hearing that cannabis is safe, or it's not just being implied that cannabis is safer, but many more people are talking about the positive effects of cannabis without a lot of discussion about the negative effects of cannabis. And I realize that saying this is going to upset some people out there because I know that there are a number of people who fought very hard for the legalization process and I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge the many known positive effects of cannabis in adults with very occasional use provided it is delivered safely and in the safe context and setting and with legality. That is entirely distinct from the issue of whether or not cannabis is safe for the developing brain and body. Again, I'm not demonizing anybody for using cannabis, but I wanna make the point very simply and very directly. It is far and away a different circumstance for the brain, for an individual to be 25 years or older and using cannabis in whatever form occasionally, or maybe even frequently, than it is for a young person aged 14 to 25 to be using cannabis either by smoking or vaping or by edible or any other form on the brain and body. It's absolutely clear that the brain continues to develop at least until age 25 and that a huge number of systems related to mood regulation, so-called executive function, the ability to organize one's thoughts, plan and execute plans, essentially to become a functional human being, right? That's one portion of becoming a functional human being, but certainly an essential one. All of that relies on the fine tuning of this neural circuitry 
that we've been talking about up until now. And it's abundantly clear that cannabis and THC in particular dramatically disrupt those processes. If this isn't clear enough just from my statements, I'd like to point to a particular paper. This is one of the more impactful papers in this area in recent years. This is a paper published in Lancet Psychiatry in 2022. The title is Association of Cannabis Potency with Mental Ill Health and Addiction, a Systematic Review. There are a number of very important points in this very fine paper. Lancet Psychiatry is one of the premier medical journals out there. And they evaluated a huge number of studies. They actually looked at more than 4,000 studies. They selected the ones that were only the most rigorous in terms of study design and analysis and rigor of conclusions. And they looked at how early use of cannabis impacted later probability of development of psychosis and other psychiatric conditions. And the takeaways from this study are very clear. First of all, chronic cannabis use, so more than twice per week, has consistently been associated with mental health disorders. I'm pulling some phrases directly from the paper. Heavy cannabis use, meaning cannabis use more frequent than twice per week, has been associated with four times the risk of psychosis later in life, in particular, schizophrenia and bipolar-like episodes. Now, we've done an episode on bipolar disorder, so-called bipolar depression. We have not yet done one on schizophrenia, but both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have a very, very strong genetic component. There's a 30, 30, 30 times greater likelihood that you'll have bipolar disorder if you have a first relative who has bipolar disorder. And then it's also the case that using cannabis, especially during adolescence and the teen years and up until age 25, create a four times greater risk of psychosis for those that have a predisposition to bipolar disorder and or schizophrenia. This is the first systematic review of the association of cannabis potency. And all of the data point to a very clear conclusion, which is the more potent the THC concentration, the higher probability of developing psychosis or a major depressive episode or a major anxiety disorder later in life. That should be of particular concern because we know, we are absolutely clear about the fact that with the advent of all these new strains of cannabis and with the engineering and availability of cannabis at much higher potency, meaning THC potency, the risk of psychosis is going up and up and is likely to continue going up unless something is done to reduce the frequency of cannabis use to zero, ideally, or to very low frequency, very low potency, in adolescents and teens and people age 25 or younger.